It gives me great pleasure as the new chairman of the Lakshman Khadirgama Institute to address this eminent gathering of policymakers, diplomats, scholars, corporate leaders, lawyers, civil society, and students at this landmark event on the Sri Lankan foreign policy. It has been a little over a month since I became foreign minister. I'm conscious that I have assumed an office and responsibilities previously held by some of our illustrious leaders, not least by the Honorable Lakshman Khadragama, after whom this institute is fittingly named, but also Mr. A.C.S. Hamid, Mrs. Bandar Nayaka, and several others, each of whom have left the invaluable legacies for international relations. While it is early days of my tenure, I can say that one of my priorities is to build a foreign policy and foreign service that predicts and innovates rather than react and stagnate. So I look forward to hearing the forecast and the analysis of experts in what to speak today as part of developing foreign policy that foresees and grasps the opportunities of a changing world. For my part, I'll begin the discussion by first briefly observing three major shifts that are apparent in current international order. Some of these shifts present opportunities, while some present risks, but mostly I believe that they will present what we as Sri Lankans will choose to make of them. In the second part of my address, I will therefore outline on some thoughts on how Sri Lankan foreign policy can adopt to these global shifts. Finally, I'll speak on how the foreign ministry itself must change, effectively implement policies for Sri Lankan long-term long economic and strategic interests. One, changing world. There are three major shifts. To begin the discussion of major global shifts, I want to highlight three such shifts, although many more will be discussed today. These are, first, the sustain in the economic power shift from west to east. Second, the recent social and political resistance in some parts of the world to previously established values of the global order. These values include globalization, free trade, rule of law, and democratic principles. And third, the transformation of national and international society due to rapid digitalization. The first of them, economic power from west to east. The first shift in economic power from west to east has been gathering pace for some decades and accelerated since early 2000. In particular, 2001 may be seen as a watershed moment in this shift because of China's accession to World Trade Organization. In that year resulted in estimated gains of nearly 10 billion a year for Chinese economy. 16 years later, China is world's largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity. Even in terms of nominal GDP, it is estimated to overtake the US as the world's largest economy in 2029. Meanwhile, India is predicted to overtake the US as the world's second largest economy in purchasing power parity terms in 2050. The growing economic powers of these Asian powers has also translated into more confident foreign policy initiatives. China Belt <clears throat> and Road Initiative is one of the most ambitious connectivity plans ever envisioned, which could result in one trillion of investments in over 60 countries. India is also strengthening its regional engagement, with one example being Prime Minister Modi's commitment of roughly two billion towards strengthening of India-ASEAN connectivity. For Sri Lanka, this shift from west to east is naturally a welcome development. Given our strategic locations at the center of the Indian Ocean, it provides an unprecedented potential economic opportunity if we carefully plan, actively, and pursue it. We can confidence in foundational values. The second global shift I would note is a weakened confidence, previously well-established principles that underpin the international order. These principles include globalization, free trade, the rule of law, and the liberal democracy. This shift can also be tracked back to year 2001, when the US experienced its terrorist attacks and confronted and predicament that we in Sri Lanka had faced for a long time. That is the question of how to ensure free and open society in a view of major threat to national, se national security and sovereignty. The gradual weakening of confidence in established norms and values 
especially in the West, is apparent in Brexit and last year's presidential elections in the US and the subsequent political turbulence. While global values of political and economic freedom were unfortunately never universally applied or evenly enforced in our world, there is now even more uncertainty as to how we can ensure rule-based international order, which includes norms like freedom of navigation and overflight, free trade, democratic institutions, and equal rights for all. As a smaller state in the region with increasingly powerful players, Sri Lanka should concern about any apparent weakening of support for these values, which are necessary for Sri Lanka's long-term stability and interests. To paraphrase, the first foreign minister of Singapore, the Sri Lankan-born Mr. S. Rajaratnam, a smaller state needs a rule-based international order for practical self-interest and not vague idealism, so that it can ensure its long-term objectives of peace through collective security, economic and development, and self-determination. Increasing digitalization. The third shift that I want to highlight is the growing digitalization and societies and political activity. From tweeting president to more serious concerns such as the hacking of sensitive government data and the terror networks spreading via social media, the information revolution is transforming our world. The ability of social media networks to effect far-reaching changes is not yet visible in Sri Lanka, but this is only a matter of time. Events like the Arab Spring have shown us that social media activism can be revolutionary and even anarchic, causing further insecurity in a world that is already facing uncertainty about established values. Despite the uncertainties and the risks of digitalization, however young people are fully embracing it, in Sri Lanka, as in many other parts of the world, the highest percentage of social media users is in the age of 18 to 34. Access to an endless flow of information from various quarters through mobile phones makes the younger generation more skeptical of official sources of information and less accepting of traditional social hierarchies. Sri Lanka must not fear these changes, but rather should recognize them as potentially valuable resources and find ways to harness them for exponential national growth. The second main point, how Sri Lanka foreign policy should respond to these shifts. I want to comment briefly on how Sri Lanka foreign policy can evolve in the light of each of these three shifts. Just mentioned, the increase in power of East relative to the West, less confidence in underlying values of the international order and rapid digitalization. As observed earlier, the shift in power from West to East is a positive one for Sri Lanka. This indicated by the interest of major regional powers in investing in Sri Lanka. India has indicated an interest in investing two billion in the East Container Terminal and the port along other, proje other projects like the oil tank farm in Trincomalee and the public-private partnership with Sri Lankan government. China is investing 1.5 to 2 billion in building the port city and the international financial center. Japan is also investing in key projects including the LNG terminal jointly with India and actively seeking more opportunities here. Yet despite these positive developments, Sri Lanka has so far been largely reactive to the interest of its neighbors and potential partners. We cannot afford to remain complacent, believing that we will automatically reap the economic rewards of a global shift from west to east. We will not. It is worth, it's worth noting that although China is a large investor in Sri Lanka, foreign direct investment from China in other regional economies like Laos, Cambodia, and Malaysia is much higher than Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka must therefore develop a proactive foreign policy centered on commercial diplomacy to maximize the benefits of growing economic power in our region. <clears throat> there are several strategies of commercial diplomacy that we should pursue. It'll, I will mention a few of these. 
First, we should pursue a hub diplom a diplomacy, which relentlessly promotes Sri Lanka as the first choice location for regional headquarters of international companies, from established multinationals to expanding startups, just as Singapore established itself as a successful hub between India and China, so to Sri Lanka. As a center of entire India Ocean region that has a population of over 2 billion between Singapore and Dubai. Secondly, while thinking global, our foreign service must also act local by utilizing strategies of para diplomacy. <clears throat> As Prime Minister has observed, there are untapped opportunities in the neighboring cities and regions, including the five southern states of India. Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Telangana. These states have a population of 250 million and a GDP of 400 billion. <clears throat> the, uh, third, we continue to prioritize our proposed free trade agreements with India, China, and Singapore. If our local resources are overstretched, we should seek the external expertise and training to conclude these negotiations. Next, we need to research and pursue new sources of investments closer to home. These include the Chinese-led Silk, uh, Silk Road Fund, Export-Import Bank of China, and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, but also new sources of capital in other markets in the region, including South and Southeast Asia and the Middle East. For, fourth, we need we should research the potential of engage the proposed mega FTS like the regional comprehensive economic partnership and, la and similarly advocate greater trade liberalization in regional groupings that Sri Lanka is already part of, like BIMSTEC, the Indian Ocean Rim Association, IRA. The potential of IRA, for example, is evident in its numbers. It is member states that represent more than a quarter of global population, yet less than 10% of the GDP of the world. IRA of today could become the ASEAN of tomorrow. Six, we need to promote the integration of Sri Lanka, small and medium enterprise into the global and the regional value chain. Seven, just as India has done with its own diaspora, we must reach out to overseas Sri Lankans. They, are, they have networks and know-hows that we currently do not even appreciate, let alone leverage. Sri Lanka's overall mission in pursuing these strategies is to maximize the economic benefits of its unique location at the center, center of trading networks in the Indian Ocean and the doorstep of the Indian subcontinent. In other words, Sri Lanka must cultivate a dual identity as both the center of the Indian Ocean and the gateway to the subcontinent. Several and other economies have successfully built and leveraged such dual identity, including Hong Kong in relation to China, Singapore with ASEAN, and even New Zealand with Australia. As I have explained in the recent interview, Hong Kong built its prosperity by marketing itself an international financial city, as well as a gateway to mainland China. Achieving a successful dual identity, however, is not merely a commercial task. Sri Lanka's commercial diplomacy must be founded on clear and stable principles to underpin the policy consistency and investors' demand and to safeguard our security from emerging regional power players and that already apparent in the South China Sea and the Korean Peninsula. This brings me to how Sri Lanka should respond to the second global shift, weaken the support for values of international order. There may be some in Sri Lanka who are tempted to see global shift from away from these values as an opening for Sri Lanka. For us to be less bothered with standards like the rule of law and free trade, I take a different and a more long-term view. An international rules-based order is essential for Sri Lanka's peace and security, economic growth, and democratic stability. Indeed, smaller countries like ours rely on rule-based order as far as more preferable alternative to the scenario of rule by force a game which we cannot win, and certainly not alone. It is for this reason that Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew once wrote that Singapore must remain committed to upholding the rule of law in relations between states, even if there are limits 
to the efficacy of international law. Sri Lanka's development as a center of the Indian Ocean cannot, cannot afford a weakening of international rules and principles, like the freedom of navigation, com commitment to the law of sea, and democratic values. This is why President Maitripala Sirisena signed the Lakata Concord this March and the Ayora Summit, affirming the freedom of navigation, a culture of democracy and human rights. And the Prime Minister Vikramasinghe has recently spoken of the Code of Conduct for military vessels in the Indian Ocean. Our foreign policy must therefore continue to advocate and support rule based global order. With regard to the third shift of digitalization and the millennium generation that has grown up with it, Sri Lanka foreign policy must look upon this shift as unusual opportunity with high potential. Sri Lanka has developed great minds, expertise that are pushing the boundaries of information and communication technology in both the education and the private sector. For example, in 2013, the University of Moratua had the most number of student projects accepted by Google Summer of Code program for the seventh year running, beating all other universities in the world, including the National University of Singapore, which ranks seventh place, and Peking University, which was ranked ninth. Our IT professionals have created software for global clients like the London Stock Exchange. Achievements like these can, can be multiplied if our foreign policy goes beyond formal diplomatic relations to establish value people to people links with partner economies. For example, our missions abroad can assist the thousands of Sri Lankan students studying abroad, including in India and China, to obtain internship in high growth companies and in new industries. These students may then return to Sri Lanka with networks that can tap. Even if they remain abroad, we can tap them for ideas, network, introduction, and other assistance. The, how the foreign, poly, foreign ministry should respond to these shifts. I have already ventured into my final point, which is the need for our foreign ministry to develop into a proactive and a unified team of diplomats and missions beyond the current situation in which have excellent foreign service officers without comprehensive and transformative team support. To take full advantage of the shift in economic power to Asia, we should and will prioritize commercial diplomacy. Our re recruitment should be target professionals from the private sector, even if only on secondment, and commercial attaches in our missions abroad need to be skilled in trade negotiations and fluent in the local language. We will work to attract young Sri Lankans who have studied abroad in countries like China, so that we will gain officers with required cultural fluency and language skills without significant addition investments of time and money. There are several foreign ministries in other countries that offer valuable examples for commercial diplomacy. The New Zealand government developed its national brand as New Zealand Incorporated, and it ensures that New Zealand private sector is deeply involved in the strategizing New Zealand's trade policy. Officers in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and even the media advisors have previously worked at senior level in the dairy sector, help to ensure synergies and transfers of knowledge between New Zealand foreign ministry and the private sector. As to how the ministry should promote international principles like the freedom of navigation, free trade, the rule of law, human rights, we can begin by formulating an organizational mission which states the aims of Sri Lankan foreign policy and the principles for which we have always stood. Just like staff of, uh, staff of leading private sector companies are guided by corporate mission, so too should our foreign policy officers. The Netherlands is one example of a nation that does this well by explicitly stating that its foreign policy aims to achieve security, prosperity, and freedom. Finally, in view of digitalization and the millennium generation, the ministry institutional culture and structures may need to have an overall. We can increase the reach of our digital diplomacy, especially by penetrating from markets such as China, using channels such as Weibo and WeChat. 
While a few of our missions already usefully employ digital diplomacy, every mission, social media, should be proactively market our country and opportunities. For example, of this approach, one needs only to look at the Facebook pages of some of the foreign missions here in Kalampo. It has been observed that most important aspects of foreign policy is the people who make it. And if the ministry is attract the best and the brightest of the millennial generation, it must be attuned to the, their expectations. The millennial don't want to stay and hierarchical bureaucracies. Rather, they want to horizontal workplaces where their voices are heard from day one with clear targets and merit-based advancement. If we want, if we want uh, the younger innovators, we must be committed to the culture of innovation. We cannot promise casual clothes and table tennis at our offices like in Silicon Valley, but we can start with new practices like an idea, ideas lab, online, in person, and an open door policy. Many foreign services are already offering valuable suggestions. To some, our relations with India over the years has been built on mutual confidence and respect for each other. What we have to ensure is that this cordiality is not exploited by political or any other opportunists to their advantage. Therefore, it is incumbent on me to safeguard our even ever strengthening relationship to fortify to the highest of levels. Sri, to Sri Lankan foreign policy must prioritize commercial diplomacy, take a clear stand for values that are in the long-term interest and embrace not fear for digitalization and millennial generation. This is a tall order, but we can achieve it together. As the late Honorable Lakshman Kadiragama said, our difficult, our difficult peace process, it's not a question of putting a rabbit out of the hat. Likewise, building a foreign policy for our changing global order is no easy task, but it is imperative nonetheless. During these changes times, we cannot afford to stand still. Let us move ahead and grasp the hand of others who, like us, want to secure a continued peace and prosperity. Thank you.